But without further ado, we are going to begin our journey through this book of the Bible called Judges. And as we like to do at the start of a book of the Bible, we like to kind of get the roadmap of where we've been in the Bible story so far. And so let's go all the way back to Abraham. Abraham in the book of Genesis. He was the father of the nation of Israel. He's the father of all the Hebrew people. And God gave him the promise that he would have as a 75-year-old man with no kids. He would have a vast nation as his descendants. And that those descendants would inherit a land of their own called the promised land. And so Abraham with his wife Sarah, eventually they had this kid called Isaac. Isaac in turn had a son called Jacob, and Jacob was the father of 12 sons from whom the whole nation of Israel descends. And the name of these 12 sons are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we're going to be hearing a lot about those names in the book of Judges, the names of those tribes that descend from those sons, even here in the very first chapter. The most famous of Jacob's 12 sons was a guy called Joseph. He had a very famous colorful coat, if you remember. And through various trials, he rose up to become the second in command in the whole of the Egyptian empire, second only to Pharaoh himself. And he moved his whole family, his uh, brothers, their wives, his nephews, nieces, his parents, he moved them all to live with him in Egypt during a famine. And everything was pretty much hunky-dory. But then their descendants stopped being treated as honored guests of Joseph and ended up being enslaved by the Egyptians. This led to the famous story of the Exodus where God raised up Moses who told Pharaoh to let my people go. And eventually the people were allowed to leave Egypt and they began their journey to the promised land, the land that God had promised to Abraham four centuries earlier. And it took the people about 40 years to get to the promised land. That's not because it's a long way. You can walk it very easily in about 12 days. But it was because God was doing a work in the people, and the people kept rebelling and turning away from God. But eventually, they made it to the border of the promised land. And by this time, they were being led by a man called Joshua. And this time last year when we were sat out on the breezeway under the warmth of the patio heaters, we were going through the book of Joshua, hearing about people like Rahab or hearing about how Joshua didn't really fight the battle of Jericho. He didn't do a whole lot. He just walked around the walls. We saw Israel fail miserably when they trusted themselves, but we saw how miraculously uh, they were successful when they trusted in God. If you missed that series or need a refresher on that, and then please check out our website in the sermon archive or in our app as well. It will give you a good foundation for the storyline of Judges. But in the book of Joshua that we looked at last year, the people cross into the promised land and very quickly establish themselves as the new rulers in town. They conquered cities, they conquered cities, they conquered land. And for the most part, the land of Canaan became theirs. And so if the book of Joshua was all about the conquest and division of the land, then the book of Judges is about what happened next. After Joshua and that Exodus generation died, how did the people of Israel fare? Did they live in harmony with one another and with their God? Were they obedient to God and to the stipulations laid down in the covenant? Short answer, no way. That pretty much sums up the book of Judges. It's a book about how the people of God got better and better at not obeying God. And the structure of Judges is set up to show us just that. In fact, there are three main sections. There's an introductory section which we're going to look at today which sets us up. It's a transitional, transitional section that picks up the story where the book of Joshua left off. And it shows us the state of the land at the beginning of this period. Then the book ends with a concluding section, which gives us two horribly sad stories that show how deep into sin and rebellion God's people had sunk. And then the middle section of the book of Judges is the meat of the book, which tells us the accounts or the stories of these different judges. And now the name Judges is a little bit misleading. In our day, when we think of the term judge, we either think of this Or maybe we think of a more famous judge like this. Or maybe you even think of these guys. When we think of a judge, 
We think of someone who tells you if you're doing right or wrong, if someone's being successful in their field or not. But the judges in the Bible didn't really do this a whole lot. Only one of the 12 judges in this book is mentioned to be in any kind of authoritative position to make judgment calls for people. And so the name Judges probably isn't the most helpful title that this book could have been given. So when you hear the term Judges, instead I want you to hear the word Deliverers. Not the guy who brings the Amazon parcel to your front door, but someone who God raised up to deliver the people from their enemies. And so our book, structure of the book has these three sections. This transitional introduction, the book of deliverers, and then the concluding stories. And if we were to list the three main themes of the book of Judges, we're going to see firstly that it's going to contain a broken people. People who kept turning away from God. People who keep chasing after worthless idols. And people who end up in misery and oppression. Along with those broken people, we're going to see messy saviors, messy deliverers, people who God used to bring about the rescue of his people, but who weren't paragons of virtue themselves. And we'll see a glorious God over it all, a God who promised to be faithful to his people, even when they are faithless, a God who has pity even on people who actively reject him. A God who saves his people even when they've done nothing to deserve it and everything not to deserve it. Broken, messy, gracious. That's what these three arrows on the stage represent. A broken people, messy saviors, and yet a gracious God over it all. And this is the purpose of the entire book of Judges. The book of Judges isn't some mere historical account that chronicles the events between the time the people entered the nation of Israel until they crowned their first king. It does cover that historical time period, but the author or the authors of this book have a much more spiritual purpose in mind. They wanted their readers, and I believe God wants us, to see our desperate need for him. If we're left to ourselves, we will live broken and messy lives, chasing after idols, which we think will satisfy us, but always leave us feeling empty. But God is a gracious God who will always draw his people back to himself. And he is a God who always provides a savior. And we know the ultimate savior, one who is in no way messy like in the book of Judges but one who is our great and glorious King Jesus, who saves us for all time. So with all that in mind, let us now turn to the actual text and see what God would have to say to us through his word today. We're going to be covering the introductory section of the book of Judges, which goes all the way from the first verse to chapter 3, verse 6. Also going to be looking very briefly at the first account of the first judge, uh, so that we get a picture of what's going to be coming in the rest of the book. So we've got a lot of ground to cover this morning, which means we're not going to be able to dig deep into this passage. But my goal is to help you see the overall structure of what is going on here and so that you can see what the author is trying to convey in these verses. That way, when you read it this week during grow group time, or when you read it yourself at home, which is something we always recommend that you do, whenever we go through a book of the Bible, we encourage you to read it at least once, if not multiple times. And then you'll be able to understand what the author was trying to do, and hopefully see what God is saying to his people through the book. Uh, so this introductory section can be split into two parts that both have a very similar structure. At the start of each section, we're told that Joshua dies. Not that Joshua died twice, but the author is using the death of Joshua to mark the beginning of these two sections. Then each section goes on to describe what the people were doing during that time, and both sections end with a, with a picture of God's response to what the people have been doing. And where these two sections differ is in what they describe. The first section describes the physical realities of this time period. And the second section describes the spiritual realities of what is going on. So we're going to first look at the physical realities in chapter 1, verses one, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 5. 
And so the section begins with these words in chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Joshua. This not only kicks off the book, but it also ties the book into the whole biblical narrative that has happened so far. In fact, it really ties it with the beginning of the book of Joshua, with, which starts with these words, after the death of Moses. This both shows us that a transition for the nation and but also transition for leadership is happening. But it should also remind us that even though the leaders of God's people can change, God never changes he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. On a very side note, Her Majesty the Queen of England celebrates her 70 years of being on the throne today. Uh, 70 years ruling the country. It was it's, uh, the 6th of February, 1952, that she became the Queen of England. 70 years. And she's constantly praised for her constancy. With the whole of England and all the politics going up and down like this, the Queen keeps us nice and steady. Uh, but she's only a very minor, minor being compared to the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who's been reigning for thousands upon thousands of years. Uh, then this section on physical realities seems to continue the description of conquests that were familiar in the book of Joshua. But rather than simply conquering the land, the people are trying to possess the land to remove any of, the of any of the former inhabitants from living there. The first 20 verses describe the southern military campaign of the tribes of Judah and Simeon. When you read this section, you'll see their reliance on God and their reliance on one another as well. And because of this, they generally had success and God blessed them. But this wasn't as much the case for the northern military campaign. In fact, this separation between the north and south ominously foreshadows the split that will happen in the kingdom of Israel between the north and the south, with the south region being much more faithful to God and the north turning very quickly to idolatry and apostasy. In verses 21 through 36, we see the decreasing success and increasing compromise of the people. And when you read this, I want you to notice how the language changes as we move to these descriptions of the different tribes. Let me highlight it to you. It says this about the tribe of Benjamin. The Benjaminites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the Benjamites. For the tribe of Manasseh, but Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth Shan or Tanakh or Dor or Ibliam or Megiddo and their surrounding settlements. They pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. For the tribe of Ephraim, nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Giza, but the Canaanites continued to live there among them. For the tribe of Zebulun, neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nahalol. So these Canaanites lived among them, but Zebulun did subject them to forced labor. But then we move to the tribe of Asher and notice how the language changes. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon or Alab or Axib or Helba or Ephek or Rehob. The Asherites lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land because they did not drive them out. For the previous tribes, we're told that the Canaanites lived among the tribe. But here we're told that the tribe are living among the Canaanites. Similarly for the tribe of Naphtali. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath. But the Naphtalites, too, lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land. And then lastly, for the tribe of Dan, we're told, the Amorites confined the Danites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain. So the, Danites didn't, the Canaanites didn't live among the Danites. The Danites didn't live among the Canaanites. In fact, they were so strong that they kept the Danites into the hills, being kept up in the mountains, so they weren't able to farm as well or prosper and build as well. And so you see this gradual decline from a successful southern campaign to a northern campaign, which begins with the Israelites subjecting the inhabitants to forced labor and ends with them being pushed back to the hills. This was not the plan. And this is what, not what God commanded them to do. We know ultimately from the story of Joshua that the battle belongs to the Lord. We saw that with the mighty walls of Jericho. Joshua and the people just walked around a few times. God is the one who destroyed the wall and gave them victory. So what is going on? 
How come God wasn't helping the people in these battles and enable them to conquer the land as he said he would? Have you ever asked yourself that question? You're trying to do the things God calls you to do, whether that be just growing as a Christian, but things keep, seem to be tripping you up over and over again. Or you try to love your husband or wife in the way that God calls you to, and yet your marriage constantly feels on the rocks. Or you try to raise your kids in the church and raise them by godly principles, but as they grow, they seem to be heading further and further away from the things of God. You feel like God's asking you to do these things, but there doesn't seem a whole lot of help in doing them. I can imagine that's what some of the Israelites were feeling like as they struggled to fully possess the land. And now the reasons that you might be struggling in these areas might not be the same reasons why the Israelites were struggling. One of my Christian heroes, Hudson Taylor, once said, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Often we're keen to see God working and we're keen for the outcomes that God desires, but we're often less concerned with doing it all the way, God's way. And that's definitely what is happening with the people of Israel. And so let's look at God's response to what is happening. Let's read the end of this first section in Judges uh, chapter 2, uh, starting uh, in verse 1. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. They all become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place Bochim. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. And so firstly, God reminds them of the covenant promises he made to them. He says, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. God had proved again and again and again that he was a faithful God, that he was in control and was able to protect and defend them if he would but rely on him. He was able to make the sun stand, stand still in the sky so that Joshua could fight longer in his battle. God could literally do anything. Secondly, God reminds them of their end of the covenant relationship. He was going to save them, and this is what they had to do, verse 2. You shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. But the people broke that covenant. Instead of seeking to keep themselves pure and removing the Canaanites from that land and destroying their pagan worship, they entered into covenants with the people. Maybe those pragmatic and practical people took over at this point. Maybe they said things like, why go to all the effort of getting rid of these Canaanites when we can make them our slaves and have them build our cities and work our land? Surely that makes more sense. But that's not what God called them to do. And the problem, as we shall see, is even if they're subjected to forced labor, the Canaanites didn't stop worshiping their pagan idols. And that is what led to the people of Israel turning from their God. And so God laid out his punishment for the people breaking the covenant in verse 3. I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. In other words, because they disobeyed God, it was going to become harder for them to obey God. And we're going to see that become true as we look at the spiritual realities at the start of the book of Judges. Chapter 2, verse 6 is where this section starts, and it begins with Joshua being alive again. It's like the author is rewinding us back to the beginning so that we can look at things from a different perspective. We're told that Joshua and his generation began to inhabit the land, and initially they followed the Lord. Verse 7 says, The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him. And he had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. 
but it didn't take long for things to turn, turn south. Verse 10 says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then in verses 11 through 19, we get a description of how this next generation lived. And these verses set up for us what is going to be the pattern for the whole second and main section of the book of Judges, what we call the book of deliverers that we're going to be digging into next week. And this pattern is often referred to as the cycle of the Judges because it's going to be a pattern that we'll see repeated again and again throughout this book. So let me read verses 11 through 19 to you of chapter 2, and then we'll build our cycle. Verse 11. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of, their, out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with them and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. And so this cycle always begins with the same 10 words. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Throughout the book of Deliverers, we're going to see those exact 10 words crop up every time we see a new cycle of the judges beginning. That's our cue that we're starting this cycle all over again. Because when the Bible was written, uh, they didn't put in the chapters and verse numbers. They didn't put in the titles above the pages. And so the biblical authors use repeated words or phrases to mark the beginning of these new sections. And the book of Judges is this 10-word phrase that will become the ominous sound that God's people are rebelling yet again. And so this is the first step of our cycle. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And this causes God's anger to be aroused against the people. And this is a characteristic of God that we don't like to and don't often talk about. God hates sin, and it makes him angry. But don't mistake God's anger as being anything like the anger of humans. Our anger is more often than not a result of us getting our own way or being inconvenienced. Our anger is a result of a sinful heart throwing a hissy fit. But God's anger is a result of his complete and utter holiness. He is a God who dwells in unapproachable light. He is a God who, whenever anyone in the Bible story sees him, they become quivering wrecks because they're convinced they're about to die because they set their eyes on the purest and most holy being ever. And so sin stirs up God's anger. And his anger is a holy anger. Sin goes against the very fiber of God's being. He knows how much damage it does to our own souls. He knows how much damage it does to the people we sin against. He knows how much damage it does to our creation. And the evil that the people of Israel did aroused the anger of God. And so in his judgment, he raised up one of their enemies to come and oppress them. God was saying to them, you want to chase after the false gods of those nations? Then be my guest. See how it is living with them in charge of things. And this is the second part of our cycle. God raises up one of their enemies 
to conquer them. Then after a period of time, God would raise up a deliverer to begin the process of rescuing his people. And the reason that God did this was because he had pity on them. Verse 18 says, Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For, this is the reason, for the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. This seems to contradict our understanding of anger. In God's anger, he hears the groanings of the people and he's moved to pity them. And so he steps in to help by raising up a deliverer. And so this gives us the next few steps of our cycle. The people cry out to the Lord. And so God raises up a deliverer, one of the judges. And through that deliverer, God graciously rescues the people. And I say graciously because they definitely did not deserve this. One of the things we've been teaching in children's ministry over the last few weeks is what is grace. We've been trying to get the kids to understand what grace is because there's so much grace right at the beginning of the Bible story. And the way we define grace to the kids is God's kindness to me that I don't deserve. God's kindness to me that I don't deserve. And by this definition, God was amazingly gracious with the people of Israel. He showed kindness to them. He pitied them and saved them, even though they were far from deserving it. And then the land has a time of peace. For as long as that deliverer lived, and occasionally even longer as well, God blessed the people for turning back to him, even though they still weren't perfect. But the reason we call this a cycle is because it keeps going round and around. The people once again would do evil in the eyes of the Lord, and so the cycle would begin again. This is the storyline of the book of Judges that we're going to see detailed six times in the section we call the book of deliverers. And so let's briefly look at the first one of these now to see this cycle in practice. This is from Judges chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. And this is about the judge called Othniel. Verse 7. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's our 10-word key phrase that kicks off the cycle. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. We don't have time today to look at the detestable practices that these, these false gods uh, got worshipped by, but they were atrocious. Verse 8. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathain, king of Aram Naharain, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. So here's step two of our cycle. God's anger burned against the Israelites, and so he raised up a foreign enemy to rule over them. The name Cushan Rishathaim literally means the doubly evil one from Cush. We don't get any other details about him, but we're meant to get the idea that this is a bad dude. Verse 9, but when they cried out to the Lord, that's stage three of our cycle, the people cry out to the God and he was moved to pity. And so, continuing verse 9, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. God raises up this deliverer, Othniel, who happens to be the younger brother of Caleb, of Joshua and Caleb fame. Verse 10, the spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. And so here we see God working through the deliverer to graciously save the people. We see that it's the spirit of the Lord that came upon him. And it's that phrase we're going to see used a few more times about different deliverers in the book. But using that phrase, we're meant to see that it wasn't in Othniel's strength that Israel was saved. It was only by the strength and grace of God. And then verse 11. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. And that's the final stage of our cycle. The land had peace for 40 years. In other words, a whole generation. And that's the cycle of Judges. And next week, when we look at the story of Ehud, we'll see the cycle repeated again, and we'll dig a little deeper in. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, 
correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You can sometimes feel that these accounts from the Old Testament are so remote in time and location that we struggle to see what they have to say to us today. But God saw fit to include these in his holy scriptures, which are here to teach us and rebuke us, correct us, train us and equip us for the good works that he's prepared for us to do. And so I want to leave us with a couple of questions so that we can reflect on that came to my mind from this introduction to the book of Judges. Firstly, I want you to think back to the physical realities section of this introduction, where Israel were guilty of partnering with the inhabitants of the land, leaving their culture and religion intact, and leaving that opening to be influenced and corrupted by them. And so a question for us to reflect on is this. What voices do we allow to influence and shape us? What voices do we allow to influence and shape us? We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. This is a very measurable truth if we're willing to be honest with ourselves. We allow ourselves to be influenced by different content on a daily basis. We open up ourselves to all the opinions that the world has to offer. For example, how many hours a week do you spend watching cable news? No matter which side of the spectrum you listen to, the messaging of those news networks is designed to influence you and designed to shape and mold your opinions. And if you listen to the same opinions again and again, they'll slowly become your own. The same goes for talk radio. It's really entertaining listening to a passionate and frustrated radio host explode. Oh, but over time, their opinions become your own. The same happens with social media. Many people, including many in this room, spend hours each week scrolling through their Facebook feed or whatever social media feed they use. And in between the, the baby pictures and the wedding photos and all the ads, there are various shared articles by your friends. There are passionate opinion posts by your contacts. And the more and more that you read, the more and more your opinions are formed by them. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm not saying that you have to stop watching cable news or listening to talk radio or get off Facebook, though for some of us, nothing will be better for our spiritual life. And by some of us, I mean all of us. You don't need to stop, but you need to be aware of how you're being influenced by these media streams compared to how much you're being influenced and shaped by the Word of God. And it doesn't take too much of an astute cultural observer to see how the church is being more shaped and influenced by the world than by the Word of God. And then for our second reflection thought, I want you to think back to the spiritual reality section. The people of Israel were guilty because they went after the idols of the culture around them. In our day, idolatry is a lot less obvious to witness. There aren't golden statues that people bow down to or pagan altars we go to sacrifice at. Where the voices that we're influenced by can be easily measured, the idols that we follow can be a lot more subtle for us to nail down. Our hearts are idol-making factories, as John Calvin once said. One of the most soul-searching things that you can do is ask God and spend some serious time reflecting on the idols that you have. These could be anything from your spouse or your kids or their success, your job or your career, your comfort or your sleep, your home and your possessions, your vacation, your retirement, your finances, our idols are anything outside of Jesus where we look to find our ultimate satisfaction. We don't have time today to reflect more on what our idols are. But if you'd like to reflect on this more, I have a worksheet that can help you discover some of your possible idols. And I'd love for us all during this series to take that opportunity uh, to use this worksheet and to reflect on what your idols may be. If you'd like a copy, email it to you. Just write on your connection card, idol worksheet, or come and chat to me afterwards and we can get you a copy. But let me challenge you to make this your prayer throughout this series. God, 
please show me my idols so that I may turn from them and worship you alone. But let me finish by encouraging us to read this book of Judges with humility. It's easy to look at this repeated cycle and judge these people, thinking that we would never be so foolish. But that's just not true. Just like they did, we let ourselves be influenced by the voices of this world that desire to lead us away from the living God to worship dead idols. And just like them, we deserve to encounter the anger of our God. We view ourselves as much more refined, but our sin is still as real. And if the book of Bible were written about us, every couple of chapters we'd hear this phrase, and the people of Clovis did evil in the eyes of the Lord and aroused his anger. Pause for a moment and reflect on this truth. My sin arouses God's anger. God hates my sin. I deserve to face God's wrath. But we have the amazing privilege of living on this side of the cross, where we don't see a messy Savior come and rescue us temporarily but we see God himself stoop down to save us once and for all time. When Jesus hung on the cross, he faced the anger and wrath of a holy God because of our sin. And Jesus faced the punishment that we justly deserve for that sin. The book of Judges should leave us humble because we should know that there but by the grace of God go I. And the book of Judges should leave us thankful, eternally thankful, because the true Savior of the world has come, the Savior that all these messy saviors pointed to. So be humble and thankful. Be amazed by the grace of God he shows to rebellious people like the Israelites in the book of Judges. Be amazed by the grace of God that he shows to individuals like Andy Giles, who deserves nothing but wrath. And be amazed by the grace he shows to rebels like yourself. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you as the one who gives us amazing grace. We praise you as the one who died to save us, to rescue us for all time. We praise you as the one who gave your life for us, shed your blood for us, so we could be forgiven. Jesus, this is far from what we deserve. It's far uh, from what we earn. We've earned the exact opposite. And yet you pity us. And you sent Jesus to be our savior so we could be yours for all time. Lord Jesus, please keep us humble. Please humble us with these words that we may never rely on our own holiness or goodness but would always cling to your cross please help us to be more shaped by your word than by the thoughts of this world and please help us not to worship idols though things that this world says are good and satisfying and please help us to worship you above all things for our own joy so that you get all the glory we ask in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.